All right. Three, two, one. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get bumpy. It oh, yeah. is Thursday on the podcast daily. The master of juice is here, Anthony Schlegel. I am just Austin Ward. And Schlegs, there's nothing bumpier than the transfer portal, right? It is oh. December and it is crazy time. You've I'm I was excited to talk to you about this. I don't know how excited you are, um, but you've talked a lot on social media. I've seen a lot of your comments. You've you've been on the coaching side, you've transferred yourself when you were a college yeah, athlete absolutely i have yeah. you're, you're you're plugged into all of this i i can't think of anybody better to talk about this and what's going on with the buckeyes in college football than you so let's do it let's get into it uh and i want to first say that florida state should be in the playoffs <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and and honestly you know what though guys like here's the deal how how quickly people forgot that alabama had to beat a team that just got beat the week prior to new mexico state in auburn Though it was a rival on the road, fourth and thirty-one to get not to get to the not to get to the SEC championship game, but yep. they would have then had two losses. And to me, it goes like this: Did you win every single again? We have Power Five conferences for a reason. Did you win every game in our conference champion? Yes. Did you win every game? Yes. Did you win every game? Yes. Okay. Did did you guys did you win every game? No. Are you a conference champion? Yes. Did you win every game? No. Are you a conference champion? Yes. Do we have any common opponent? Yes. We played each other. <laughs> Who won that game? You, Texas, okay, you're in. There you go. That's how, that's how I kind of think about it. It's very simple because I also believe their, their third-string quarterback would not be playing in the, the national championship game. It would be their second-string quarterback. Right. But they had an elite defense. And, again, how do you settle these things? You set them on the field. Like, how does, how does Alabama go from one week almost getting beat by Auburn to next week beating the number one team in the country? It's college football. It's about right. execution. And so you let it happen on the field. That's what it is. And I don't understand people – and 19-point games and et cetera, et cetera. But it's how you set it up. It's all going to change with the playoff, but I just think that's where they should have been. All right, now, transfer portal. <laughs> Question. Hit me, please, sir. Yeah, well, you've got me opening up that can of worms, but there's so much wrong with the College Football Playoff Selection Committee. We don't have time for that. Ohio State was one play away from not even having to worry about the, the transfer portal window opening on Monday. They've got 12 players in there. Yeah. There's all this hand wringing across the country. Oh my gosh, the, there's something wrong with the culture at Ohio State. There, do people not trust Ryan Day? Like, yes, there are two starters in there, and one of them is the quarterback. But this is also when you look, you talk all the time, Schlegs, about 1080 10 and the principles that you guys used, um, maybe not just at Ohio State, but certainly with when you were working with Urban Meyer. Uh, that bottom 10, you don't, you're not entitled to stay forever, right? And sometimes, and that's not to paint every situation the same. Somebody like Jacob James is moving on because he needs an opportunity and he's put a lot of time and effort into Ohio State. Like He's not jumping in there for a, a bag of money or something like that. It's an opportunity situation. So you know, not everyone is going to be the same. And I would say no. that looking at it from the, the broad picture for 12, that's also why I'm not suggesting there's something dramatically wrong with that number. Well, here's the deal. Last year, right, there was 22 guys that left Ohio State that we really didn't think about, right? Alabama had the exact same. And then selectively, what do we do? We only brought in two. Okay, so when you recruit at a high level that we do, you're always going to have attrition, guys. It just it just is what it is, and it's going to happen. Um, the portal is very different. Now, let, let, let's there's varying degrees as to why. And I was I, I, I'm going to be straight up forward with you guys. Like I, I might miss some things on here, but it's okay. So let's take me for an example. All right, I'm going to give you a. a I went to the United States Air Force Academy. Coming out of high school, I was 5'11". I wrestled 215. I was a state champion. I was a national champion my junior year. My senior year, I was second in state. Um, I had more offers to wrestle than I did playing football. I went to the Air Force Academy. I went to the prep school the first year. I was a team captain. I went to the Air Force Academy my freshman year. Um, I was a starter. I was a freshman All-American. Then I came back. I was the only ever sophomore captain at the Air Force Academy. I was all-conference. And I left. Why did I leave? Well, I was an absolute asshole my freshman year. I got a ton of demerits. I ate that. I spent confinements for six months in my room. No problem. Everything hard about the academy, I absolutely loved. Everything about the military, I absolutely loved. My sophomore year, I'm playing. I'm a captain, still somewhat of an asshole um, because I took care of my freshmen. And yeah, I kind of bucked the system a little bit, but I got in trouble for driving off campus to get treatment because I pulled my groin because I didn't miss a game. I didn't miss a practice. Never have my entire career, even in the NFL. Like, it's just something that I didn't do. So when they asked me about it, integrity first, serve for self, excellence in all we do, 
I still carry all the things that I learned at the Air Force Academy. They're part of my DNA. Um, they were going to bring back a lot of the stuff that I did my freshman year that they say were, were gone. And I was like, no, just based on principle, I'm not going to do that. And all my guys that I played with totally understood while I was leaving the academy. And I got told by Coach DeBerry, and rightfully so, like, hey, listen, if you leave, like, where are you going to go? You're going to walk on somewhere. I'm like, sure, I'm, I'm going to bet on myself. So I left and I had to sit out a year and I chose Ohio State. And, I, and people were like, when I was getting re-recruited, why do you want to go to Ohio State? Like you have A.J. Hawk, Bobby Carpenter, Mike D'Andre, who was the number one linebacker in the country at the time, a guy named John Kerr coming in. You had Marcus Freeman, you had James Warnice coming in my senior year. Tons of talent, tons of competition. I'm just like, I just want to go be with the best. And most importantly, Trussell was very similar in Fisher to Barry as the way they handled their program. Mark D'Antonio was coached by my D coordinator at the Air Force Academy because Mark D'Antonio himself left West Point and went to South Carolina. That was coached by Richard Bell. I absolutely fell in love with the dudes that were there, the, the, the Simon Frazier's, the Bobby Carpenter's, the Krenzel, the, the A.J. Hawk, the Nate Sally's, the Dante Whitney. Like, I loved them, man. I was like, these are my type of dudes, just hardworking, grimy dudes that want to win, that want to play football, that want to that want to create friction. Like that, that's what you want. And I so so I chose that. Right. I chose that. That's not for everybody. That mm -hmm. was just me. So there was an opportunity I left to potentially go somewhere else. I did not know where it was. It wasn't like everybody offered me. I looked at the situation. I went to AM where my wife was going. They were went, were going from a four th or a three four to a four three. They had a ton of linebackers, ton. And I really didn't want to stay in the state of Texas because they didn't necessarily recruit me. So I'm like, bump it. I'm going to go somewhere else. So anyways, that's how I came to Ohio State. Mm -hmm. And you still had to go earn it, right? So how did I earn it? Well, your, your, your red shirt year, right? I had to take a red shirt year. It was competing on scout team. Like now the red shirt year is gone. You can instantaneously go right into a program. That's cool. Right, wrong, or indifferent. doesn't matter. But that's how you did it, right? And then you go and you compete. So there was an opportunity to go to a, I would say, a higher level. There's also opportunities to go to the same level, transferring from an Ohio State to a Florida, to a South Carolina. Because, yes, you can go to the, the league in all those areas. And, again, guys' dreams uh, should not be devalued, right, just predicated upon what fans think they should or should not do. So, again, I, as you know, Austin, I never pass judgment when it comes to the game of football on players that play the game because I was a player. And, all, and everybody, when I played, talked trash about me. So I, I totally get it. It's also why I don't, you know, harp on players, right? I, I go after coaching more than I do anybody else. But there's a variety of different reasons. And, at, you know, as you look at, so those, like those are two. Then there's another one. It's like, I just want to go playing time. I can't necessarily compete at Ohio State. I'm going to go somewhere else. And I might go to an Akron. I might go to a Toledo. I might, nothing wrong with those schools, but you want to play. I totally get that too. Okay. So then, so those are three options of leaving to go play. And again, always remember this, man, you get out what you put out. And so this is where I go back to the value proposition in college football is changing from a coaching perspective. And I was talking to a buddy of mine who coaches. There's a couple of things going on right now in college football where uh, you better be really good at recruiting. I mean, it's like, it's, it's now finding a balance also on staffs of who can recruit, who's good at the relationship, who's good at roster management, but also you have to know ball, right? So you can't have a, a, a staff so focused on, on recruiting, but not no ball. Cause you're all going to get fired. But then if you know too much ball, but you can't recruit, you're all going to get fired. Cause you don't have the horses. Like it's just, there's a fine balance that we're starting to see uh, transpire at the coaching level. Okay. So those are just some things that I'm, I'm seeing in this portal. And I also say this too, I think too many times because we have, we are fans, we have a, an affinity for our brand, for our university, because of whatever it means to you that we forget that these things transpire in the, in the business setting as well, right? Like, let's just take Ohio State, for example. Let's say you're a phenomenal business and you don't meet your numbers for the year. What are they going to do? They're going to go evaluate. They're going to go look at what's going on. You might be the top sales rep in your business, but you haven't met your numbers. What's going to transpire? They might try to bring somebody else in. They're going to they're gonna make sure that you hit those up. So they're going to be more micro in your face all the time. You might not necessarily want that. So you're going to seek employment elsewhere, or you do want it and you want the challenge and you want to stay and compete and get those sales, but you're also going to go back and say, okay, was it the marketing? Was it the supply chain? Was it the operations? Like, could I, could I not deliver product to my people that, that affected my numbers? You're going to look at all those different things when you're looking at that opportunity, right? right? So that's, that's competitive excellence within a business setting, but then it can be like, Hey, 
I'm going to transition now to like recruits leaving, which is completely fine. Um, fans shouldn't get caught up as, oh, Ohio State lost them. No, they just made a financial decision or an opportunity to go somewhere else uh, and, and leverage the two. That happens all the time. And there's nothing absolutely wrong with that either. People do it all the time. I got an offer from this company. And they have all these other underlying things that are really good, but they offer me less money, though yeah. there, there is potential for more growth. But this company offered me more money. I'm going to go to that, that place. Well, you as a company that potentially has more upside can't lose yourself because that person wanted to go somewhere else for more money. You just yeah. say, you know what? It probably wasn't going to be a good fit because as I supported them, as I brought them up, they didn't necessarily see this. It was always going to be about that. And that doesn't really fit into the culture that we have here. So it's good that they are somewhere else. Right. So, so I, I, I see it all. I think people have to take a step back and view this thing from a, a greater prism, but that doesn't mean you have to either because you're a fan. So <laughs> I just like to lay all of that out so that we can kind of understand all these decisions. These decisions are no different than anything that's transpiring in business. Yeah. And I, th I think that's probably, got to be the biggest transition for you know whether that's me covering the sport whether that's the fans that want to have you know buy-in and, and investment and knowledge of the current roster and that those guys you know if you're an alum of Ohio State that somebody who goes there wants to see that same process through and like hang out on on high street or lane and get it the same diploma like that's the fact that some of the professionalization has clearly and the genie is out of the bottle come to college football and it's never going back I think that's got to be the hardest part to wrap your mind around. The stuff that you're talking about is true when you're looking about it from a business perspective and, and making the best money or deciding that the culture fit is more important than more money. If you're talking about, you know, Marvin Harrison and USC a year ago, like that's, yeah. you know, that's all tied up into it and you got to make the one that fits best. Like, I think that's probably where people, myself included, are having, I'm not upset about it. It's just like, well, I'm still getting used to the fact that these are now the decisions that manage rosters in college football. And, was, you know, let's let, let's just take Marvin as an example. And people are like, well, loyalty to programs are are dead. Well, you know what, though? Like, again, it's it's the value proposition. Let, let's let's just take USC, for for instance. Right. You had the guy that was from Pitt, the wide receiver. He was the Blue Nikoff Award winner. He went to USC and he ended up being the third or fourth. I, I, I forget. OK, I'm not looking this stuff up because I don't have time to do that. But right. Um, he ended up leaving. So let's think, let's think about this. So you have an offense, you're the Blumenkopf award winner. You leave, you go to USC for no reason. There might've been a switch at quarterback, you know, like there's a lot of different variables that go into that and you go to USC and then now you're the fourth wide receiver taken. You're still making first round money, but then let's take Marvin, for example. So if I leave Ohio state, I got a great coach in Brian Hartline, who's developed me. And let's say I take, let's say I take, $2 million less than what USC wanted to give me. Let's just say that's the, the fact. Mm -hmm. Do you not think that that money will be made up by being the first round draft pick? And a Heisman you know, Trophy could, finalist? And a Heisman Trophy finalist. Now, could he have done that there? I don't know. Maybe. But what, I, what I'm saying is the business decision to stay, the long term is greater than the short term. I don't have to go uh, and get good rapport with my quarterback. I already have one. I don't have to go learn an entirely new playbook. I already know this one. I'm always going to be featured here. This is the biggest brand in college football, and it is. And so I'm going to stay, though I make less, and now I'm going to be the first or second overall pick. Mm -hmm. Could he have been that at USC? I don't know. But why take the risk of gaining a two here when then potentially you move down on the board and you're the second or third pick? Right. Right. That, that It all bounces itself out. But those are business decisions. So it's like, yeah, I'm going to take less now, knowing that I'm going to make more later. And so, but you, you you can't fault anybody for going and doing one or the other. These are just the things in the part of the conversation that is being had. I will say this, too, about our coaches. We saw with Jameson Williams when he left to go to Alabama, and he was a first-round draft pick. Um, when you look at the room that he was in, Brian Hartline had a very hard, difficult conversation with him. It's like, here's where you are. Here's what we have. Here's where you are in the depth chart. I support you in whatever decision, but I'm being completely transparent. You make the decision. And he opted to go. And guess what? He's, he, he was still a first-round draft pick. Great. 
And Ohio State's wide receivers room was still pretty darn good. Right. And they were all first round draft picks. So you at least are having the dialogue, you know, and it's with Kyle, right? Like you're going to go through and about guys, listen, it is an open competition for every spot that is on Ohio State's roster every single year. That is no different than the NFL. And it's no different at Alabama. It's no different when you're at Georgia. Okay. If they have a recruit that comes in at Georgia and Carson Beck is 12 and one as a starter, and you have a recruit that comes in, that's better than Carson Beck. That person is going to play at the University of Georgia. Every year, you have to go earn your spot. That's just the facts. That's just the reality. It's a reality in business as well. You're like, hey, should I, like, listen, guys. Like, I'm not, I'm not bringing this to you as like I, I, I don't know business. I have an MBA. I have two patents. I sell a product that is in 120 Division I colleges, 28 NFL teams, and thousands of thousands of high school across the country. I know business. I know all of those things. These are decisions that we all have. It's the same thing we have with employees or it, <coughs> excuse me, and how we look at things. Like I understand the business and the reality because I also coached in the NFL and I coached in college. So I'm just bringing these facts to you um, that this is the reality in which college football is in. And I will say this. Excuse me, sinus infection doesn't got me down. I just got super bumpy doing shoulders. But I will say this too: Harbaugh is not wrong. I mean, like, and let's and I like kind of what the NCAA proposed um, this last week. It's going to be different. It's going to be difficult even for for universities like Ohio State <coughs> because you have a thousand student athletes, right? And we have thirty six sports. Alabama, I believe, has seventeen. Right? There's a difference, you know. Um, so when, if you go and you do pay some players some of those things, it's like, hey, you automatically come here. You're going to have $30,000 paid every single year, along with room and board, along with tuition. So you're going to be able to have a quality of life. You're not going to be struggling. And guess what? Even though you played 20 years ago, Schlegs, like you want guys to be better now than they were 20 years ago. Like that's just the evolution. And you got to support that. Mm-hmm. But then it's just kind of the, the, the process of it, right? So it's like, yes, you go to Ohio State. You're going to develop. You have the best coaches in the country. You have the best strength and conditioning program in the country. You're going to get developed. You're going to have an education. You're going to do all those different things. And then guess what? You play and IL happens. Okay. That's, you know, that's part of it, right? With great teams come together. You have great continuity because you're with your boys. You're not necessarily thinking financially because you're, you're supported in that capacity. I think that will kind of alleviate uh, some of the portal stuff, but I think some of the portal stuff will always happen because guys just want to play. Yeah. And so, and that's fine guys. It's okay. It's okay. I mean, I mean, Schlegs, you, you know, this firsthand guys were already transferring. Like that's been a part of college. Like, even if you're not a student athlete, uh, transferring is an option for everybody on a campus. Sometimes it's not the right fit for you. You move on. I'm not trying to like, find silver linings or make anybody feel better about Ohio State's roster transition this week, but it was inevitable because from the previous couple years, Ohio State was doing better than almost anybody else in the country in retaining their roster. I believe they had had the second fewest. I'll, I'll double check this later. We should we didn't go through all of the numbers. I didn't know that we were going to maybe get to this point, but I think they had the second fewest transfers out over the previous three cycles. They were retaining the, the strength yeah. of the brotherhood, the culture fit, it's like a lot of people ask, well, why isn't Ohio State more aggressive in adding through the portal? Well, because they were retaining their current roster. They the, the people wanted to stay. They wanted to be Buckeyes. And the more you do that, which Ohio State did for several years in a row, the more people are on your roster. And at, at some point, the bill is going to come due. And they had to have a situation like this where four or five or six or now 12, maybe they didn't think it was going to be 12 with Kyle McCord or Julian Fleming, but. And that's really where it, that's really what popped for everybody is the fact they had a quarterback that's 12 and one that is decided to depart. And, you know, I'm going to say kudos to Ryan to say, Hey, listen, it's an open, co- it's an open competition. I'm not going to sit here and guarantee you because I think too much in our society, just people in general want to be comfortable and competitive excellence is friction. It's not comfortable, but that's what, allows you to become better. I was better because I played in a room with great players. They made me better. We made each other better in the weight room. We made each other better at practice. It's just part of it, right? When you're in a business, 
you make each other better by competing within the business. Like I want to go be the best sales rep or I want to be the best marketer. I want to get the most whatever. That's great. And if you don't necessarily think like that, I'm not going to necessarily say you're wrong, but I just, I, I particularly wouldn't want to work with you because mm -hmm. I, and there's, you know, this, this, this notion of, Uh, the the notion, the notion that that is a foregone conclusion now uh, mm -hmm. is mind boggling to me. Like the tradition, the love for a team, like is no longer relevant. And I, I would say that's absolutely false. Do we not get asked every single time, "What is it that you do? What is your profession?" Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm I'm a, I'm a student athlete at the Ohio State University. Like, do you not also like want to work at a place that you like or at least love? To work at because you have a sense of pride and I work for that company. Because if you don't, you're going to go look for that somewhere else. Like we're always constantly looking for that, right? Yeah. And then when you do find that place, and I'm just, I'm just being real. When you do find that place, you have a lot of pride in what that is and what that embodies and what you what you gained from that. And I would say I would say this as well. Through going through the trials and the tribulations, right? It produces perseverance and you become mature and complete, not lacking anything. But when you look at our guys, and I can only talk from two, my perspective of playing in college athletics, like I'm still close to a lot of guys I play with at Air Force. And I'm still close to a lot of guys that I play with at Ohio State. We were all close. We all watched film together. You know, when you, when you see those guys, when you go back and visit, it's like you just pick right back up where you left off 20 years ago. Because of the trials, because of the adversity, right? Objective adversity that you gain in the weight room and, and you know, the 6 a.m. workouts that we had under Tress or, or the fourth quarter stuff that we did with Mick, right? Those guys, they remember that. I mean, I, I, I vividly remember, I vividly remember, you know, Joshua Perry coming into Ohio State, 225 bench press and 225 zero times, right? He was forged. Uh, through objective adversity and forceful adaptation to become the player that he was. Taylor Decker, the exact same way, throwing a rope on the ground and making him strain and teaching him how to strain over four years allowed him to become the player that he is. And he continues that on. Like You just see that with those guys. And because of that adversity, the group is closer. And yep. so when you go look at people that want to be at Ohio State, and I'm, again, I'm talking about potentially recruits coming in or when guys leave. It's why I think some former players take it somewhat offensive that they do leave because they know what going through that adversity brings you and gives you for life after football. Not saying that is the end all be all. I'm just saying that that's probably a perspective that they're coming from right. when they tweet stuff out. And it's, it's nothing to, and I will say this too, I'm 42 years old. You look at all the guys that like go to the NFL, right? There's a huge study. I mean, like at, after five years, like 50% of them uh, are divorced or in money problems or finance. We as men are constantly searching for that team camaraderie, that brotherhood that you had when you played because that's all you did. Like you're around that group of guys the entire time. And, and then once we become professional at something outside of the sport, those are the things that we're looking for. Those are the areas that we're gravitating to because we're trying to replicate that because it was so special. Yeah. So I just, I mean, again, I know I'm just kind of like all over the board here. Just trying to give people some context as to all the different things that go into these type of decisions, what can make people um, <laughs> very loud, whether one way or the other. I would say this. I think that Ohio State, does a very good job of, eval of evaluating talent. Joe Burrow was a Heisman Trophy winner. He was at Ohio State. He competed his face off. Dwayne Haskins got the job. He transferred. He bet on it. First off, Joe Burrow bet on himself. Could have easily went to Cincinnati with Fickle where somebody that he knew in the same state, but chose to bet on himself, win a job at LSU, take it to a national championship, be a Heisman Trophy winner in the first overall draft pick. Like, like great. You know, Quentin Ewers, he's in the college football playoff right now. And it could also be guys like somebody wants to just be closer to home. Right. That's okay too. <laughs> you know, so there's so many different variables that go into each an individual decision. You can't fault the program. You can't fault the player. You just say, hey, man, 
great job, best of luck, and move forward. And, right. and guess what? Ohio State's still going to be great next year because of everything, because of their track record of what they've done. They're going to be fine. Yeah. You know, I will, I will say this, and this is a little side nugget. It's more imperative now than ever of team building, as I like to call it, right? Whatever it is that you want to do for that year. Um, I always like to say objective adversity, uh, forceful adaptation that, that used to be used. And, and strength conditioning has changed over time. But the building blocks of the team really happen in January through July. The earlier you get those portal guys in, the better. Mm-hmm. Uh, because when they go through that adversity, when they go through that strain with their teammates, remember Justin Fields transferring in, he came in in January, his teammates automatically got to see him compete and strain and grind through the process of winter conditioning. That's now more paramount than ever. Mm -hmm. As you then approach spring ball, learning the offense, learning the defense, being able to perform, showing your teammates what it is that you are capable of, and then going into the spring. In our end of this summer. So I just think that there's even more of an emphasis on that more now than ever uh, of team building that is that is emphasized in the offseason. So when we're talking about, you know, managing all this schlegs, I mean, you've been through it, as we said, every time, like you've you've coached it, you've you've lived through these decisions. Like, yeah, with your perspective now, like what's what's the advice you give? I mean, it may be different for a high school recruit, may not be maybe the same for uh, someone in us in a program like. What, what kind of advice are you giving guys if you're managing this situation from their side now? That's a great question. I'm going to start with the recruit, and then I'm going to go to uh, a current, an active uh, player um, in, in college football or any sport for that matter, regardless of gender. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have a 17-year-old. He's a junior. Um, plays baseball. He's a lefty pitcher, outfield, first base, hits. You know, and and I'm I'm very real with him. Uh, I'm like, you know what? He wants to play baseball. He he has embraced playing. I mean, again, it was a process. Just because you're Anthony Shoyo's son doesn't necessarily mean you absolutely love to train. Okay, I'm just letting you guys know that, right? So it's a process. I've I've actually learned more training my kids and high school kids to be a better coach than probably any moment that I did when I was actually coaching. But I'll say this: I'm very real. I believe that he's probably a division two type caliber baseball player. That doesn't mean he couldn't potentially be number one because guess what? A, a division one player. I, I myself at his time, people would have probably said that Anthony Schlegel is a division two caliber of linebacker. Um, so that's fine. And I, then I, I grew into, I worked through that process to then go to, you know, the air force Academy to Ohio state to the NFL. Okay. So that being said, my advice to him is this. Um, we live in Florida. Florida has bright futures. Bright futures is that you can get 75% to 100% in-state tuition to a college of your choosing predicated upon your GPA and your um, your SAT, ACT score. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can, your school also pays for credit, college credits, so that you could, you could actually graduate high school with your first year of college done. So my, my thing is this to him. Go out and, and first off, Take those college credits, those dual enrollment classes, so that, and also have a great GPA, also have a, you know, a great SAT, ACT score, whatever the case may be, um, so that you put yourself at a competitive advantage when you are being recruited. That's one. And then as you go through that process, I'm like, so now you have an option, right? And because you are what you are, I'm like, and I, I, I don't want to be dictated as to so you're a pitcher only or you're this guy. Like, you know what? You add value in, in a variety of different ways. Let that coach figure it out. But you need to choose a college predicated upon what is their type of education? What is the type of development that they have? What type of strength conditioning program? Do you want to be close to home? Do you want to be far away? Like, you got to, like, all that goes in the factor, but you at least set yourself up for success because then, right when you come into the door, you're automatically going to be a sophomore. And so, yes, you could play two or three years at that program, getting financial, um, whether it's through the state or whether it's through the program, and you go there and you work and you develop and you're there for three years, and let's say you're doing well and then you potentially want to transfer. Well, now, you, or even if you want to stay, well, now you've already got a degree and now that financial assistant goes into getting a master's or you leave and now 
Now you go somewhere else. Maybe it's a division one, maybe it's a one double A. I don't know the case, whatever it is. And now you get a master's from there. And then if you want to continue to pursue sports, right? Baseball, you have an avenue, but you also have that degree. Now I'm not, and here's the thing. I, not everybody in all of sports that go to colleges are going to play professional. So, so when I give that advice, I look at the totality of it and it comes from my own experience, guys. When I transferred from the Air Force Academy, I myself was not able to go to the Fisher College of Business right away because I had so many um, engineering courses, aeronautical engineering, engineering mechanics. I had junior level German, like, like those were classified. So I didn't have enough uh, of the business side to go into Fisher. So I went to human ecology. I personally should have literally just went into engineering, got my undergrad quicker, and then went and got a master's in something else, whether it was sports management, kinesiology, things that I was passionate about, whatever. Then I would have left college. Instead, I had two minors, which mean nothing. Okay. Then I went back in, in my 30s and did an MBA while coaching at Ohio State. So that's kind of my advice to recruits is, you know, but it's also like, where do you feel you're going to get developed? Who has the best strength conditioning program? And I'm going to give you a side, another side nugget. Uh, we have a family friend that's um, going through some trials and tribulations uh, at a program, right? They, they feel a little bit ostracized by the strength and conditioning program. They feel that they're making a, an example of him because he might have like missed some reps or whatever. My advice to him is you, there's one thing that you control every single time you go into that weight room, and that is your energy. That is your attitude and your effort. So if you want to make an impact on them, be a great teammate, have a great attitude, give great effort, and guess what? You will no longer be an example. Now, I, I don't condone that. I also understand how it could happen in certain instances, but that you can control what you can control. So I just want to give you a perspective as to what they see and what they're trying to do from their team, but also things that you can manage yourself, right? If you go in there juiceless, you're somewhat useless because now the coach has to bring you up. Like, that's not the point. When you coach at a high level, the number one thing is teammate on teammate accountability. I coach the spotter more than I coach the guy in there because on the field, it's teammate and teammate accountability. Outside of, outside of the Woody, right? It's teammate on teammate accountability to make good decisions off the field. So those are the things that you're trying to instill in them through the, through the weight room. Okay, mm -hmm. so so those are very true. Now, let's take it when you're uh, a transfer kid. Um, what's going on? What's the development look like? You know, are you being coached? Is the coach having dialogue with you? Have you gone in there and advocated for yourself? Or, you know, like I believe it should be the, the student athlete. Go in there and advocate. Get real talk by your coach. That's also something that you've got to vet. I mean, God bless my wife. She's a read of people, man. Like she's phenomenal. But like when, when you're in that process, are they smell, selling me smoke and mirrors? Like where have they been? Have they been in a school for a long time? What are the players saying? Like, hey, how is this coach actually? You know, Fickle was phenomenal. He was very transparent. But I had to advocate for myself when I was at Ohio State. Right. I mean, it's just the reality of the situation. Hey, I'm more consistent. I'm making the same deal. I have a higher grade, but yet you want to play him. And yet he gets... 50% more blitzes than I get and our numbers are equal and my grade is higher Then how can potentially you do that simply because you think he has a higher ceiling, but doesn't consistency win? Like advocate for yourself. Mm -hmm. And if you find that the development is not there or the dialogue is not transparent and honest, then you, it is time to, for you to, to look elsewhere. If it's like you've grown in your development, because here's the other thing too, Self-introspection is, is a quality that not a lot of people take, especially parents dealing with their children or even internally, whether it's business or whether it's sports, it's where am I actually at, right? Like, so it's 90% of my ceiling, 75% of the other person's ceiling. Well, if they're at 75% and you're at 90 and we're completely equal, where are they going to lean to? They're going to try to develop that other 75 because as soon as he goes to 76, he's already better than me. Right. That's just the reality of the situation. So if you're like, man, th this program's really developed me. I'm at max capacity. I'm not seeing the field. I need to be take be able to take that elsewhere. And I got great football acumen. This coach has done a great job investing in me. I'm going to take it. I'm going to bet on myself. I'm going to go play somewhere else. While simultaneously, I'm going to go finish my degree and go get a master's at the same time. Boom, home run. Always remember, you get out what you put out. And that's that. And as you make these life altering, <coughs> excuse me, decisions. Those are the type of things that I would 
type of advice that I would give to people. Yep. Um, I, I think it's critical. I think that they, they shouldn't be devalued. I think that the more wisdom that you get from outside resources that actually have your best interests and not necessarily the best interests of that program or potentially another program, um, all need to be laid out on the table. And then when you are convicted and you decide to plant that flag and you plant that flag and you freaking go. Whichever way that is, I'm going to stay at Ohio State. I'm going to go through it. Iron sharpens iron. I want to go. Great. Plant the flag. Go. Don't look back. No regrets. That's just going to be what it is. Right? Mm -hmm. Hey, I want to transfer. Here's what I'm looking for in the schools. Here's what I'm looking for in a coach. I also read a great tweet about how the transfer portal for college coaches is better than the high school one because there's so much ambiguity as to what a high school recruit wants, but transfers know exactly what they want and exactly what they're looking for because they've been in a program for X amount of time. Right. And so they can be like, yeah, we can offer you that here, you know, but, but again, I, I always go back to, it's about the relationship. Something that Trussell was so great, great at, um, have a great relationship with your position coach, have a great relationship with the strength staff, look for a strength staff that wants to maximize all of your capacities. And I've always said this too, the value proposition is strength and conditioning now at the college level is very similar to, to the, the same approach I had when I was with the Jaguars is my job is to maximize your value and extend your career. Whether you're a 10 year vet, eight year vet, third year vet, practice squad guys, I need to make sure that you are maximized, that you are healthy. So when called upon, you can respond to go potentially get that first contract, sign a second contract, or even extend your contract for another two years somewhere else. Like that's my job. That's my responsibility for you. Strength conditioning now in college, it's more that way, right? My job is to prepare you. Weak things break. Let's look at your weak things. Let's make sure we enhance those. Let's freaking get you strong. Let's get you explosive. Let's make sure that you can accelerate all the things that they already currently are doing. But when you do leave, making sure that you leave better than you are when you got here. And then also being able to pick up the phone and call a strength coach or where they go, say, hey, here is Anthony Schlegel's numbers. I want nothing but the best for them. Look, guess what, man? Kids talk. People talk. Yeah. So like, you know, like to me, that's, that's great because that's when you, when you recruit kids and you say, I'm going to coach you the way that I coach my kid. That's how I coach my kid. That's it. That's the responsibility that we have. So a lot to digest right there. <laughs> right. But I just think that those are some of the nuggets that I would give a recruit or somebody that's potentially wanting to transfer, uh, as they look at, at this, because when I chose Ohio state, I had other schools that wanted me. I chose Ohio State for competitive excellence and the people. It was the most similar brotherhood and type of mentality that I had when I was at the Air Force Academy. And that's why I chose it. And that's why it's so special to me because I know the people that were before me were there with me when I played and have came through the doors after me because I had the, I was blessed and fortunate enough to coach those guys. And, and that's just why my heart is for that university, right? So that, that's why I'm invested in it. But still, nonetheless, hopefully good nuggets that everybody can take out there for their kid as to how I approach it and look, look at it. Well, that makes December uh, really, really busy for Ohio State. And that doesn't include really anything about the Cotton Bowl against Missouri. We'll talk about hey, that I, another time. <laughs> hey, I'm just going to tell you this right now. Missouri's hungry. They want to, they have more motivation. I think we can agree to win this game than Ohio State does. Like well, no, I, I wouldn't say motivation. I would just say their guys are there. You know what I mean? Like well, the, uh, the continuity yeah. is there. But you know what, though? Like the motivation, really, when I look at that game, is every time I go out, you know, I got to show out. Juicy J, man. I mean, yeah. like that's, that's the deal. Hey, now's your opportunity. Boom. Bring them in. Let's freaking go. Right? Great. Happened in the combo. Rose. Let's go do it. Happened, happened, in the Rose Bowl game. happened in the Rose Bowl. So who will be next? Carnell Tate, it's uh, probably going to be your turn. But definitely Devin Brown and Lincoln Keenholz. That opportunity is in front of them now uh, with Kyle McCord out. Um, a lot more of that roster management, coaching decisions, everything else uh, coming throughout this very busy December ahead of that game. We're going to let Schlegs go heal up from that sinus infection. He made it through to give us another bumpy Thursday on the podcast daily. Hey, Schlegs, feel better. I don't. I, I feel great. I mean, I got to get on some vitamin D, more vitamin C, some zinc. It's all good. All right. You know, get that. I've been working out. I've been hydrating. I've been bending my knees. Bending your you knees. Know, so, so ankle. Get out of my bunk. Or shin, shit angle. What, what do we have to get right? 
No, that's more acceleration work. Okay. All right, guys. Well, I'm just trying to learn. I learned from the best. He's Anthony <laughs> Schlegel. We have him in. Uh, appreciate his insight as always. A, a great stuff on uh, what it's like to transfer and managing the transfer portal in this era of college football. Four Schlegs. I'm Austin Ward. Thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you later.